So these uh, remaining rules are going to be the last ones for uh, the new proofs. And the important thing about these next two are that they have restrictions associated with them. So the first one is EI. EI is exactly like UI, except we have restrictions. We can't do it whenever we want. We have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. But fundamentally, it looks the same. Existential X, PX can become PA. Or whatever letter you choose, we chop off the quantifier and replace the individual constant with a name. However, it can't just be any name. We have to ask ourselves these two questions. So the way EI works, we can take an existential statement and make it an instance, but we have to ask ourselves two questions. Does A occur before? So the letter that we choose to replace the variable with, does it happen anywhere else in the proof beforehand? Does it happen in the premise? Does it happen in a line before? If it does, we can't pick a letter that's already been picked. Very, very important. We can't pick a letter that's already been picked. The second is, does A appear uh, in the last line of the proof? Or does A appear in the conclusion? If the answer is yes, if A or whatever letter you choose appears in the conclusion, then it's no good. So if you can answer no to both these questions, does A occur in the proof before? And is A in the conclusion? If you can answer no, you're good. You can do EI. If you answer yes to just one of those questions, you can't do it. So let's do a proof and ask ourselves those questions. So first and foremost, right, we'll start with this. So line three, uh, well look there, I got, right, I can do UI just like I've been doing. PA arrow EA, line one UI, right, line four, oh, Right now it's time to use our new rule. We have our existentially quantified statement, PA dot RA. And that's line two EI. But remember, before you can use EI, you have to ask yourselves the question. Right? I always write it and then ask myself the question. First question, does A occur earlier in the premise? And does A occur in the conclusion? Well, A does not occur in the conclusion, so we're good there. But A does occur previously. So this is not right. This is wrong. We couldn't do this. A exists beforehand. So this is no good. So this is the fundamental reason why we get the tip EI before UI. EI has restrictions. So we choose to do EI first so we can make sure that UI, which has no restrictions, can come afterwards and match it. So in this case, if look what happens if I start with EI. PA RA, line 2, EI. Ask yourselves the questions. Does A occur anywhere else in the premise? Does it occur in this case just in line 1 or 2? No. A has not been used before. Does A occur in the conclusion? No. So we are good to move forward with EI. So now I can choose A in line 1 because UI has no restrictions. So I can make my stuff match, which is really important. Now it's just a simple proof. Again, a good strategy, getting an instance of the conclusion, right? Because I know that if I can get that, I can make the conclusion happen really easily by using what rule, right? EG. So I'm going to do my handy dandy simplification, right, on line three. I always do simp twice. You never know when you might need it. Right, so we got that. Now, EA from lines 4 and 5, MP. And line 8, remember, thinking about that strategy, I've got all the pieces I need, EA and RA. From lines 6 and 7, and that's conj. So now I can finish it off by using existential generalization or EG. I could pick X if I wanted to, but I choose to pick Y because that's what's in my conclusion. And I just replace the letters. Line 8, E, G. Really straightforward. Just that make sure you ask yourself those two questions and remember the tip, EI before UI. I always remember EI before UI because alphabetically EI would come before UI. 
We choose EI, but so we don't have to worry about violating the restrictions. EI before UI. So let's move on to our next rule, UG, which also has some restrictions. So UG is a lot like EG, except for, again, we have some restrictions associated. So we could take something that looks like this and change it into this, as long as we ask ourselves these three questions. So UG says, right, you can go from this to that, but you have to ask yourself, does A occur in the premises of an argument? A, does it occur in the premises of an argument? Two, did you get A, or whatever letter you're doing UG on, did that come from using EI? Well, if EI is not in your proof, then obviously the answer is no, but if A came into the proof through using a EI, you can't use UG on it. And then finally, is A in the line that you're actually using UG on? So is A, or whatever letter you're using, is it in this line also? So, for example, if it looked like that, I don't know. If that was the case, this would violate the third restriction. So if you can answer no to all these questions, then you're good. If you have to answer yes to one of these questions, you are no good. So it's really important that you think about what you're doing. And remember, UG is just like EG. You just have to pass these three steps. So let's do a practice problem with that. So we got this going on. Again, looking at my quantified conclusion, I'm thinking, okay, if I can get PA arrow HA, maybe I can use UG to turn it into the conclusion. So I have two universally quantified premises, so I'm just going to unpeel them real quick. I'm going to go just the first one first. PA arrow A, A, line 1, UI, line 4. I'm just going to peel out line 2, uh, A, A, arrow, H, A, line 2, UI. So now what to do, right? This is why it's really important that you study and do a lot of these practice problems because some of you probably see that pattern right away and some of you might have no clue what to do next. That's why it's really important because even though rules like the one that we're about to do don't come up that much, when they do come up, you really need them. So hopefully you see the match between these two, right? If you have this kind of pattern, you can skip the middleman and create a new conditional through using HS. And so now that we have right, we have a match, let's go ahead and do UG. But now we have to ask ourselves those three questions. So first question, does A, in this case we choose, right, we're talking about A because that's the letter that we transformed. Does that exist in the premises? No, A is not in the premises. Did we get A through an application of EI? Did A come into this problem through EI? Well, no, it didn't. And then finally, is A in the line that we used UG on? No. So we pass all these restrictions, therefore this is a valid use of UG. Later on, we also have to note that you can't use UG in an undischarged assumption. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the, the proofs with RAA and CP, but that's a fourth restriction for UG. No using it when there's a line out to the left. So, we know these two problems now, so let's do one big problem to kind of sum up all our new rules. So, we got this here problem, thinking about some tips. Again, looking at the quantified conclusion, maybe if I can get RA and PA, I could be done. So, how do we start this problem? Well, I have a universally quantified line and an existentially quantified line. Remember, EI before UI. So I'm going to do EI first. RA dot QA. And that's line 2 EI. Ask yourselves the two questions. Uh, does A appear anywhere else in the proof before it? If the answer is yes, don't just skip over this. Really ask yourselves the question, has this letter been used already? If the answer is no, you're good. If the answer is yes, pick a different letter. So A has not been used, so we're good there. Does A appear in the conclusion? No, it does not. So we're good with EI. Now we can do UI, because remember, there's no restrictions. Do not, do not, do not be the person 
that picks B on line four, thinking that you have to use a new letter when you use UI. Remember, you do not have to use a new letter with UI. There are no restrictions with UI. You can pick whatever letter you want with UI. I chose A because I wanted to make it match, because now I can do stuff with it. Right? So, for example, I can get simplification on line three. And again, I always do it twice, because you never know what you're going to need. And so now I'm looking around, thinking about my old proofs. Well, looky there, a match for MT. Don't forget to right, add on that new tilde, because it's tilde to the left side. And it already had a tilde, so we have now two tildes. So it's lines 4 and 6 MT. Right? Hmm. Well, I'm getting really close to this, right? I've got RA, but I've got tilde tilde P. What rule lets me get rid of those tildes, right? Don't forget about your equivalency rules. They're not going to come up very often, but when they do, again, you're really going to need them. So don't forget about your equivalency rules. MI, De Morgan's, all that stuff is still fair game. DN. So now I can, right, to get that instance, RA dot PA, and that's line 5 and 8 conj. And so now, using EG, I can finally get my conclusion. You could pick any variable you want, but again, I pick Y because that's the one that's given to me in the conclusion. And that's all there is to it. Really straightforward proof, not too difficult at all. Just really make sure whenever you're using these new rules, ask yourselves the questions, do they violate those restrictions? The restrictions will be listed on the test, so you'll have that for you, and that'll really help you out, but really make sure you're doing that. So those are our two new rules. We have one last rule called QN, which is really straightforward. It's kind of like an equivalency rule. It's a little bit complicated, but here's the way I think of QN. I think about QN moving the tilde through the quantifier and changing the quantifier. So for example, that right there, I'm going to move the tilde from the left side to the inside, from the outside to the inside, and that's going to 